you got it set to M for mini, when it should be set to W for Wumbo. Besides discovering that I may follow the absurdist theology, I've done a few things with my free time recently. The first is getting through those Dark Horse published Zelda books, namely the Encyclopedia, where I came across something that inspired me to play through Wind Waker again, and ultimately make this video. It's such a small detail, but reading the developer notes and seeing that a programmer for the whips of Majora's Wrath was put in charge of the string physics for Wind Waker, it made me wonder what other game functions were shared between these games. This was the console follow-up to Majora's Mask after all. On a surface level, these games could not look more different. But is Wind Waker a truer successor than I initially realized? Welcome to my first video of Majora's Mask month in March. 15 ideas exclusive to Majora that were adopted by Toon Link's first adventure. Number 1. Returning Enemies Let's kick things off by talking about baddies, first born from the world of Termina. In terms of Zelda sequels, it's expected that series enemy mainstays return. Octoroks and Keys, for example, have been monsters since the very beginning and they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Though it's kind of rare for a unique enemy made later on in the series history to return. In the case of Majora's Mask to Wind Waker and even beyond, several original beasts of Termina were surprisingly brought back in some fashion. Georg, the gargantuan masked fish, was shrunken down to be a mook of the great sea. Swish. Just not quite as small as when he's defeated as a boss. Real bomb chews of Majora are creatures that the mechanized bombs may be designed after. These guys have an explosive tail that ignites upon contact, blowing themselves up in the process. In Wind Waker, the spirit of these suicidal rodents are upheld, as bomb chews are what standard bomb throwing rats are now called. So luckily in this era, evolution was kind, and a cruel god didn't Frankenstein this version of the monster with bombs as a literal part of their body. Lastly, the gelatinous choo-choos that reign over Termina Field cover many of Wind Waker's islands, their design thankfully made cuter. Let's just say I am very glad there's no choo-choo jelly potions to be made from these guys. Link would probably fall dead. Not that dead though. Number 2. Spirits While on the topic of the afterlife, two integral characters to the plot of Wind Waker seek out Link as ghosts after being killed. Lerudo is a Zora Sage of the Earth, and Fado a Kokiri Sage of the Wind Temple. They perished at the hands of Ganondorf and linger on because they have unfinished destinies to pass on ceremonial knowledge to their blood ancestors. This is similar to the plight of Mikau and Darmani, heroes that died before they could save their people. While assisting the dead isn't exclusive to Majora's Mask, the cutscenes for both pairs of spirits are similar. Music is involved with the healing of each and all bets are placed on Link to aid in what keeps them tethered to the living world. Number 3. References So it's clear that we're reminded of Wind Waker's predecessors in a number of ways, but what about direct references? In background decoration it's mainly Ocarina of Time, with the stained glass windows in Old Hyrule Castle for example. But Majora's Mask is thrown quite the Stalfos bone too, one of them being Tijo's drums, the Zora performer for the Indiegogos, and the Bunny Hood appearing alongside the All Knight, Goron, and Keaton mask in the Nintendo Gallery. Phantom Ganon Sword even has the Mountain Smithies, Zubora, and Gabora's names inscribed on its blade in the Hylian language. Perhaps most interesting though are a few members of the Rito tribe bearing the same face of certain characters from Termina. Which brings me to my next point. Number 4. The Post Office 
Bido, the postal assistant, has an uncanny resemblance to the part-timer of Clocktown's trading post. The post office manager looks exactly and fittingly like the postman of that game as well. You could say that technically these are Ocarina of Time characters, but because one is a teen hire and the other boasts the same profession, it looks like these are descendants of Termina. And at least for Kaboli's case, this isn't just an eerie lookalike of an age past. He is said to come from generations of postmen and is heavily implied to be a descendant of this one specifically, or his Hylian equivalent, if you believe that retcon about Termina disappearing after Link saves it. With this all said, there must have been some interspecies relations going on between this man and a member of the Zora tribe, because remember, the Zora evolved into the Rito when Hyrule was flooded by its goddesses. With both Princess Rudo and Mipha of Breath of the Wild expecting to marry Link, this isn't exactly looked down upon in the world of Zelda. Just weird to imagine the bumbling postman having his happily ever after with a fish lady. Anyway, Majora's Mask is the first in Zelda canon to feature a post office, with a minigame and side quest to be found between both entries. Number 5. Post Boxes for those of you I didn't scare away, with all that we're brought to the talking, moving post boxes scattered throughout these two worlds, starting with Majora. Wind Waker takes this silly idea of mailboxes with personality and makes them even more animated. They'll now dance around whenever there's a new package for Link. I'm not sure how these things work exactly, whether they're alive or mechanized somehow, but I'm glad at least something in this world is happy to see me. Number 6, Hide and Seek. Another similarity that extends to gameplay is the Bomber's secret society of justice, compared to Wind Waker's killer bees. Both groups are a gang of children rude to outsiders, and will only respect Link after proving himself with a game of hide and seek. While only a side quest this time, it still works to ease players into the layout of Windfall Island, as it does Clocktown. Number 7, Recurring Character Tingle, for better or worse, is made a major character too, retaining his cartography skills and, uh, whimsical design from Majora, the first game he appears in. While cut from the HD release, the GameCube version includes extra story bits when using the Game Boy Advance connectivity, unlocking a device dubbed the Tingle Tuner. At least I can still use this thing, thanks Miiverse. During your travels, he'll speak of a legend based around himself from the Hero of Time era, referencing his helping that Link with callbacks to the balloon he travels on being repeatedly popped. Number 8. Map Quest Speaking of map making, the optional quest of filling out each island for the map of the Great Sea is a natural progression from completing Termina's Atlas, compared to the 49 islands of Wind Waker. Vital information about the locations are also given by these fishmen, which can be seen as a step up from having this gentleman reintroduce himself every time cycle. Number 9. Pirates And you can't have the Great Sea without pirates. They're crucial to Link's quest in Wind Waker, helping the boy leave Outset to confront the beast that stole away his sister. The only other instance of pirates that precede Wind Waker are the Oracle games, but even earlier is, you guessed it, Majora's Mask. The Gerudo of this game are seabound rather than women of the desert, and much like Tetra's crew stealing bombs to access Jaboon's lair, these pirates swipe Lulu's eggs because they hold the secret in accessing the Great Bay Temple. Considering the next two games that follow the N64 classic feature pirates in plot-centric ways, it's possible both Capcom and Nintendo were inspired by it. The ability to transform Link and play as many of these fictitious races is a cornerstone to the gameplay of Majora's Mask, but while all his forms vary greatly from one another, it's still Link that's behind the mask. What might not be as obvious is that, while only a minor segment, 
This game was the first to include a player-controlled character that isn't Link. Cafe, in a panic to escape the labyrinth of Seiken's hideout before his engagement gift is stolen away forever. Two years later, Wind Waker pushes this idea further with a great emphasis on control. Seagulls, statues, then later with the next generation of Earth and Wind Sages, Medley and Makar. Unlike Cafe, who's simply player controlled with a change of perspective, these two must be entranced with the command melody, making Link an apparent master of puppets. Number 11 Returning Items The sole returning item exclusive to Majora is the Picto Box, which sees upgraded features in this game as well, mainly the deluxe Picto Box with ability to snap pictures in full color. Additionally, while the Deku Leaf is entirely new, it seems to be a borrowed idea from Deku Link's ability. It allows for soaring through the skies like his floral helicopter, and the Baba Buds shot out of act like the Deku flowers of that game. Number 12, Fast Travel. Fast travel or warping in Zelda games has been another convention that's been around since the start, and appears with a different flavor in each usually involving music. The first use of wind to teleport was the NES original, but Majora was the console game to bring it back, with Kipora Gabora's wings to Wind Waker's cyclones. The method of learning and inputting just one song then, rather than obtaining a separate item, and choosing between several locations on the map, was an extension most to the system Majora established. Number 13, Voice Acting and Sound Effects Sachi Matsumoto is a voice actor that was hired on first to play Skull Kid in Majora's Mask, and must have left quite an impression, because she was brought back for subsequent games with higher responsibility, a leading role as Link in Wind Waker. For sound effects, upon defeating the very first boss, Goma, I was surprised to hear a familiar hum when the portal opened up. It emits a noise that is indeed repurposed from Majora's Mask. It's sampled from the game's Final Hours track. Number 14, Trading. Trading quests are another convention that are certainly nothing new to the series. But both Majora's Mask and Wind Waker see side quests that give off the same vibe. Title deed trading with business scrubs and exchanging items by contract for the wandering Goron merchants work to highlight Link's role in expanding their business. The talk of desire for greater opportunity is shared between the dealers, and it again feels like a progression of an idea that Majora sparked. Link owning property is a shared quirk as well, though I'd much rather hold the deed to a private island cabana than a flower. Number 15. I think we should end this thing where it all started. String. And that unnamed programmer from Majora's Wrath, we have to thank for its function in Wind Waker. In all seriousness, from a mechanical standpoint, rope is used quite a bit. There's gameplay requirement, with momentum swinging from the grappling hook. And for enemy design, with these moblin spears and bosses hanging from the ceiling. It's important to note because the programmers took advantage of this as a showcase for more realistic physics. I've noticed the ropes for the drawbridge leading to Fairy Woods is one of the first things that can tip a new player off to the upgraded engine. For the time, this was really impressive. Being interactable, you can slice them and they'd fall as you'd expect. If the bridge is narrower too, cutting the string and standing in the center will cause it to collapse. Someone then on the Wind Waker staff must have thought the way these whips work were ahead of their time, because they're on full display here. So to wrap things up, I'm sure there are even more similarities to be discerned, like both games featuring a smaller total amount of dungeons, and the greater emphasis on time cycles than in previous games. But hopefully this provided a coherent list of everything major carried over. If I missed something, please let me know. I just wanted to express that Wind Waker has a lot to thank for Majora, and really did improve on a lot of that game's mechanics. Keep an eye out for these details next time you play through the game. I'll see you all soon for the next video of Majora's Mask Month.